welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 108th episode of The Simple Sophisticate. And if you're tuning in on the day this goes live, well, live in the sense that it's available, it is the first day of summer or winter, depending on where you call home. So we are, in a way, turning a corner, starting a new season, doing something with a fresh start or clear eyes. Today's topic is inspired by a an interview that I heard recently. And it was a very simple statement, but it was profound to me, partly because of the success that this person has achieved. And so therefore, the credibility that this person brings to their statement is quite impressive. But also because it often is something outside of ourselves that makes us realize what we have within ourselves. But before I get to exactly what the heck I'm talking about, let me give you a hint as to what this week's petit plaisir is. It is a summer dessert, or should I say a spring summer dessert that is brand new to me. And I was so excited to try it. And well, it turned out absolutely delicious. And it's so simple. So I hope you'll tune in to the end of today's episode where I'll share exactly what that recipe is and how to make it. Trust me, it will impress not only your taste buds, but I have a feeling your guests and family and friends as well. But back to today's topic, the title of today's episode is what Lynn Manuel Miranda taught me. And if you have been paying attention to the news lately or the entertainment and cultural news of this past year and beginning early in the fall and end of last summer, you know exactly who Lynn Manuel Miranda is. He is the creator of the now 11-time Tony-winning musical play, Hamilton. And in an interview with 60 Minutes last week, he shared a simple thought. When great people cross our path, it forces us to reckon with what we're doing with our lives. He was speaking, of course, of Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, one of the founding fathers of the United States, which is the focus of the entire musical. And while most of us have not seen the entire musical, let alone, you know, on television, but in person, this idea that one individual from history can change someone else's life path and life trek and and awareness of who they are in the world is enough to give us pause. And so when I heard this quote, I thought, okay, so all of us have probably had someone cross our paths recently or in the past where we were, we were so inspired by what they have done or how they have lived their lives or what they had accomplished that we think to ourselves, I wonder what I can accomplish if I really was willing to be courageous. And while all of us will be seeking or desiring something entirely different from someone else, There are some components that all of us can master in order to be successful in our pursuit. And so I've put them into today's episode and I'm going to walk us through them. And what I hope in my life and in your life is that when we can add these to our lives, we can make these regular practices in our lives, we will find, because we've seen it in others, an amazing change in the life that we have now versus the life that we hope we have the potential to cultivate for ourselves. So let's get into today's episode. The people we come into contact throughout our lives with either enter to offer an opportunity for us to change and grow as an individual or as an opportunity for us to inspire change in that person. And while we will never know the latter, we can always be aware of the former. And while sometimes, yes, the person offers us that is offering us a life lesson is someone that we are thankful to no longer have in our lives or be in contact with, 
I would argue that if we are continually learning and applying the lessons more often than not, the people that we have cross our paths that cause us, give us pause, we will feel fortunate that they have crossed our paths. And while clearly Miranda never met founding father Alexander Hamilton in the flesh, he did, however, meet him due to his curiosity and exploration. Perhaps that is how you have met many of the people who have opened your eyes of how to live a better or more in alignment life with who you are and can be. Maybe in a book or a class, the theater or a documentary. Maybe you were able to see them in the flesh, but only listen to their lessons from the seat as an audience member. No matter how a great person has crossed your path, when they do, if you are open, if you are ready, and if you have an inkling that you may just have more to give than what you already have been, you will be spurred to live ever so slightly or magnificently different. And no matter what you are spurred to change or to do, the ability to master the four components that we're going to talk about today will hold a key to your success of making the most of your life. No matter what occurred in your past, no matter what people expected of you or expect of you, no matter what your imagination up until now has limited you into believing was possible. So whether a great someone recently crossed your path or did so ages ago, and you still haven't exactly capitalized on the ahas that they brought into your life, not because necessarily you didn't want to, but maybe you didn't know how, here today, I'm going to show you four tools that once you accept and incorporate them into your life, will bring about profound changes. Let's get started. Number one, create a clear life vision. Oprah states, create the highest, grandest vision possible for your life because you become what you believe. In order to know what to do, we must know where we want to go. Sounds simple, but sometimes the mere act of writing down what we desire, want, or envision for ourselves is intimidating. I mean, if we put it in pen, it's real almost, right? It's like, oh, did I really write that? Do I really want that? Whether because we feel we are being too selfish or asking for too much or asking for the impossible because we have never quite seen it come true for anyone else that we see as being similar to ourselves. The act of writing down what we want our lives to become is a powerful first step. It doesn't have to be written down with such exquisite minute details such as the house I will eventually buy will be blue, but it should be something such as I will be living in a home of my own, which will provide me with sanctuary security and a place to spend with those I love. This last one is a concrete goal as well as involves a reason for why you are seeking what you desire within that one statement. You can make it a reality when you know precisely what you are seeking and you're reminded of why you want it. Wanting a house is not a bad thing. Saving up money to buy a house is not a bad thing. Some may say it's it's too concrete, it's too permanent, while others will say it's the only way to determine whether or not you've achieved success in this world. Neither of those are correct. But if your reasons are in alignment with the life you want to create, then it's absolutely correct for you. It's absolutely correct for you. Now that you know what you desire, what your vision is for your life, you can now set many goals, no matter how many it will take, because it may take a lot. But if you keep at it, you will attain your goal. Be brave. Set a grand vision for your life, as Oprah says, and then believe in yourself enough to do the work that is necessary every single day. It will happen. It's only a matter of time and initiative. So the first tool in creating a life that is allowing us to reach our full potential is to create a clear life vision. Number two, embrace your awesomeness. (laughs) Truly though, Take the time to listen, explore, and come to understand who you are, what you are drawn to, and what talents you have that may seem ordinary to you because you've had them all your life, but are actually quite extraordinary. Discover your strengths, be mindful of your weaknesses, and accept the entire you that you are. Stop as well trying to seek approval from others who you feel are superior. Instead, try to accept yourself. Come to understand why you might subconsciously seek out people who have traits you wish you had. By way of doing this, you may be seeking external approval. So when they, for whatever reason, 
may reject you, you see this as a rejection of yourself, that you are not enough, that those traits that you don't have make you a lesser person. That is absolutely not true. Absolutely not. But sometimes if we are surrounded by people that are not like us or have different traits than we do, it doesn't make them bad. It doesn't make us good. But what it does is it's showing us that we don't fully accept our strengths and we don't understand or trust that our strengths are of value. Now, let me just give an example. As someone who is a highly sensitive person, and I've talked about this in previous podcasts, I'll provide a link to that on today's show notes. Here's a perfect example of doing that, seeking out approval from someone or people who have different traits than you. And if they reject you, you take that as a commentary on you not being enough. So here we go. So if you are HSP, stop seeking and expecting non-HSPs to be uber sensitive and instead embrace their strengths. As well, begin to seek out people who can appreciate your strengths, perhaps other HSPs or others who are aware of the strengths that HSPs possess. The same can be said for any strength a person may possess. If we repeatedly return to people who don't understand us and based on their confusion or rejection lead us to feel unworthy, which we aren't, we are ultimately inflicting pain upon ourselves when we return again and again and again and expect a different result. We've heard that whole line before. If you do the same thing and expect a different result, that's the definition of crazy. But it's not I don't want to make this such a negative thing, but it's this idea of we can't keep going back to the same people who just are not going to be able to be aware of whatever uniqueness we have within us. And if they continually make us feel this, you know, not worthy, it's us that gets that mindset that we're not worthy. And we then need to choose different people to seek a connection with. It's not necessarily the people's fault that we are not connecting with. It's us in the sense that we are assuming that they will eventually understand us and get us. Sometimes it's just not possible. And we need to, while maybe not completely severing those ties, just simply limit our connection with them. The key is to recognize that there will be some people who we cannot connect with on a deeper level. We can then move on when we accept this and seek out others who we feel comfortable being our awesome selves with. And we will feel comfortable reveling in their awesomeness as well. When we fully know ourselves, we can ascertain more quickly and accurately who to invest our emotions with and who to keep at arm's length. We give ourselves a powerful tool and a clearer path to fulfillment when we stop trying to impress and befriend everyone and instead befriend authentic and mutually appreciative companions. And the key with all of that is embrace who you are, know who you are, and then travel that path instead of blindly just seeking, searching, and feeling rejected and hurt when you clearly haven't sought out people who may have the possibility or potential of truly connecting with you. So number two is embrace your awesomeness and use that as a guide as to how to move forward. Number three, speaking of moving forward, number three is let go and move forward. Here's a list for you let go of cynicism, let go of stereotypes, let go of extra stuff, let go of a particular list of six fixed life ideas, let go of what others think, discover what to let go of and what to hang on to, and discover how letting go will elevate your life. On the blog and on this podcast, we have talked about letting go seven different times. All of those times were just listed there for you. I'll provide links in the show notes to each and every one of them where we break every single one of those down. In fact, in my first post focused on the topic of letting go, I address the reason letting go is so difficult because it is. It is fearful to let go of what we know, even if it isn't exactly or at all what we want. However, the only way to realize our greatness and create the grandest vision and reality for ourselves is to let go of what is holding us back or blocking our path. Whether it is the negative thoughts we allow to creep into our minds, why not discover and learn and then become habituated in how to retrain our thoughts or seeking out people who perpetually unknowingly or willingly thrash the self that we are, why not limit or eliminate time and energy with these people? or daily habits in our addiction routines that perpetuate unknowingly the life we don't wish to lead, 
Why not involve acknowledgement and self-discipline that we can adhere to that will change the trajectory of our lives? In all of these instances, we must let go. And when we let go, we dare to fly. We dare to fly into a horizon that up until now we only gazed upon with admiration and affection. It may take longer to get there than we had imagined, but if we keep flying, if we keep trying to learn and grow, the vision can become a reality. So number three is let go so that you can move forward. And number four is to form a partnership with your mind. I want to share a simple quote with you, but it's so true. It's from Lao Tzu's. If you correct your mind, the rest of your life will fall into place. The thoughts we think spontaneously are very much like a record that has completed playing and then just spins around and around and around and around on the same track. It's basically stuck, but there is no alternative route that it can go. So it keeps doing what it knows how to do basically, whether it works. And in this case, it doesn't because nothing's playing. It's done or not, but it no that's what it's the only thing it knows how to do. And so it keeps going and going and going. It's stuck in that track, right? Well, in order to change the thoughts that are not working for us, whether it's worrying about our future, doubts that we have about the success that we can attain, the negative self-talk, anything that's not helpful, we must purposely change the thoughts that we automatically jump to in our weakest moments. We have to build up our mind's ability, much like a muscle, and then keep exercising it regularly. The good news is we are capable of changing our mind's patterns. Why? Because we made them in the first place. We weren't born with them. Now, yes, there are studies out there that say that some people are more inclined to be happier than others with regards to their thoughts, but not in 100%. We still have control. We still have this idea of these mind patterns that we have created. Now, we've probably created these negative mind patterns unconsciously. They were most likely influenced by where and how we grew up and the people we surround ourselves with now. But we made those ruts. We made those tracks. Those tracks, though, if they're not serving us, we can make new ones. And that's the good news. It takes practice. It takes conscious effort. But in time, it becomes a habit, too. And it's a good habit. And it's a habit that's helping us. We can do that. However, it does take time, but it is possible. So here are two ways that you can help change your mind's pattern, its habits. Practice creative visualization. Albert Bandura, a Stanford University psychologist, is credited with defining the term self-efficacy theory, which is the, quote, idea that we need to believe in our own capabilities to affect change and lead successful lives, end quote. And if we can successfully visualize and then bring to fruition, well, we not only reach our goals, we, quote, experience a greater sense of well-being, of optimism, and of happiness. So the first thing you can do is to practice creative visualization. And that really can go all the way back to number one with regards to creating your life vision. Create it for yourself. See it in your mind's eye. Have it written down somewhere. Look at it regularly so it becomes ingrained in your memory, a good thing in your memory that you are striving for. The second one is to practice daily meditation. In a post that I wrote in 2014, I shared six powerful ways regular meditation can change our lives for the better, from reducing stress to increasing productivity. Even just five minutes each morning every day will have a profound difference. Don't know how to meditate? I break it all down for you in that post, and I'll provide a link to it on today's show notes. It's so simple. And for the record, just for the record, I still only meditate five minutes each time I sit down to do it. And while I'm working up towards 15 to 20 minutes, even just the small amount done regularly has brought significant calm each time I I make the time to do so. So number four is form a partnership with your mind. Work with it. Don't let it work against you. These are four fundamental tools. No matter what your life vision is, no matter what potential you know you can reach, If you incorporate these four fundamental tools, they will take you places that you may have never thought even possible. 
So get ready for a transformation because it's coming. And while it will appear slow, gradual, and maybe even non-existent to you while you're in the middle of it, I encourage you to keep a journal as you make this journey of change because it is happening and you will be forever grateful for that great person who crossed your path. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode and today's topic. I'll provide all the links that I mentioned in today's show notes, the simplyluxuriouslife.com backslash podcast 108. And I'll also provide some similar posts from the archives that are tied to the topics we talked about as well on today's show notes that you might be interested in. But now we have a delicious petit plaisir that you are going to love. I'll see you in just a few. So this week's Petit Plaisir is a blueberry rhubarb galette. And while I have always been a fan of strawberry rhubarb tarts and pies, and I'll share with you those recipes on today's show notes, when I heard about this combination, I was like, I've got to try this. So where did I hear about it? Well, some of you may know that people have been making this for years. It's not a brand new concept, but it hasn't become a well-known um, combination. So I'm a couple weeks ago listening to my one of my favorite food podcasts, which is The Splendid Table, and they bring up this idea of blueberry and rhubarb pies. And like I said, I usually make tarts um, and many tartlets or mini galettes, but it's all the same. It's just you can just shift a little bit in your crust, add a little more sugar to your crust to make a tart. Anyway, so I'm thinking, hmm, this is going to be worth a try. And so I tried it this last weekend and it was delicious. <laughs> so how did I come up with this recipe? Well, first of all, I started scouring the internet for all sorts of recipes and there were as many recipes on how to make this particular dessert as there are people. So I went back to my trusted recipe of strawberry rhubarb tart and I tweaked a few things. But there are some key things that I'm going to suggest that made a tremendous difference in the flavor. Number one, while yes, you can buy frozen or you can, you know, chop up your rhubarb and freeze it and use it. I highly recommend if you want the best flavor, buying fresh and in season blueberries and rhubarb. And this was also mentioned on the Splendid Table podcast. You do lose flavor when you stick your strawberries and your blueberries into the fridge before you use them. So buy those blueberries the day of or the day before and keep them on the counter and then use them. Do not put them in the refrigerator. The, the flavor will be well worth it. And I know you're thinking, wait a second, I can't do that. Trust me, it makes a huge difference. So don't put the, so use fresh fruit, keep the blueberries out of that refrigerator before you use them and it will make a huge difference. The other part of it is you're simply going to add a little bit of sugar, add a little bit of flour, add a little bit of acid in the form of either orange zest or lemon zest. And that's basically it for the filling. And then I added my pastry crust, which I've used for many different tarts. And as long as you chill it before you roll it out, you're going to have the most buttery, slightly sweet dough that you We'll just love. As well, a family recipe that I've shared a few times in the blog, and I'll share with this recipe, and it adds a little extra sweetness, is the crumble, which includes your oatmeal and your brown sugar and your flour and your regular sugar and then your butter. And it's worth it as well. All the details on how to make this are on the blog today, the simplyluxuriouslife.com backslash podcast 108. It does not take that long to make. I'd made mine into mini galettes, so no pan whatsoever, absolutely free form. And I share some secrets on how to fold it and make it stick and whatnot. But it's just so simple, and the cleanup as well is just easy. All right. I think you're going to enjoy it. I know I did. Of course, I added a little bit of ice cream on top and had some hot tea with it, and that was just the perfect trifecta. <laughs> And be sure to stay tuned for future Petit Plaisirs as I have many other recipes that I'm anxious to try and share with you. I hope you've enjoyed this week's Petit Plaisir where each week ideas are shared to make the everyday all the more enjoyable and delicious. Tune in at the end of each Monday's podcast where I'll recommend a book, a film, or a recipe. Anything that is a simple pleasure to satiate your sophisticated taste. <music> 
thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticated Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, stop by the blog, thesimplyluxuriouslife.com, or pick up the book, Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life, A Modern Woman's Guide. To stay caught up on the most recent podcast, blog post, and receive exclusive news, as well as an extra dose of inspiration each week, subscribe to the Simply Luxurious Life's newsletter, which arrives in your inbox each Friday to enjoy with a hot cup of tea or your morning coffee, just in time to jumpstart the weekend. Until next Monday, I'm your host, Shannon Abels. Bon genie.